Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Welcome to all who call uh, life on Maine home and all within earshot of my voice today. May God richly bless you where you're at. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we, we've come into this place to meet with you and you with us. We've come to worship and adore you as our maker, creator, redeemer, savior, and soon returning king. Lord God, we just look to you for all our need. We thank you that you love us so that you sent your son and he agreed to come. Father, would you add your blessing to all that's done and said here today? May we be careful to do and say things that bring you glory and honor. Lord, would you anoint our pastor as he shares with us the burden that you have put on his heart to share with us. May we be mindful and heedful of your words to us. May they become life and health, mental and physical, to us. Lord God, we just want to give you the glory and honor. We pray expecting things. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, amen. Well, we want to take some time to read from the scriptures this morning, and we are going to be reading from Galatians chapter 6, and I will read the words that are in white, and we ask that you would read along with Naomi as she reads the words that are in yellow. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And especially to those who are of the household of faith. And may God add his blessing to the reading of the word. Let us never grow weary, it said, of doing good. And no time has that been more meaningful, I think, than the days in which we find ourselves right now. This morning, we are actually going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. And so I encourage you to turn there um, even right now uh, as we prepare to dig into the Word of God. As you know, for these last number of weeks, we have been talking about the caricatures of a Christian. And when we talk about a caricature, we're just talking about um, portrayals that are made uh, where some aspect of an individual is elaborated or exaggerated to um, kind of make a point. And this is where we're at with the scriptures. We're taking uh, these 12 weeks to elaborate on different pictures that we see throughout scripture of what it is that a Christian is supposed to be, how they're supposed to act, how they're supposed to perform, what it is that they are. 
and so that we can get a full picture of what it is God desires us to be so we can move uh, more diligently into the fullness of all he has for us. As you know, uh, we started on this trek about three weeks ago, and our first week we talked about what it means to be a child of God, and we started there because it is fundamental, it is foundational for all of the others, because it is the one aspect of a Christian that is not based on anything that we are able to do or anything that we are able to accomplish, but is simply based on who we are and whose we are. And so it's understanding that we are a child of God, that he loves us no matter what it is that we are able or not able to do. No matter what it, how successful we are or how many times we trip up, that his love is always there just as we love our own children even amongst their slip-ups. He loves us unconditionally. And that is fundamental because like all these other ones are going to be dealing with actions or, or ways that we live out our lives. And if we don't have that understanding of what it means to be a child of God that's not based upon what we're able to do, we can get caught up in religion and we can actually get um, caught in the trap of pride because we can begin to look at all these other things that we're doing and if we're doing well at those, begin to pat ourselves on the back and begin to feel like maybe we are something more than we are. And with that understanding that we are first a child of God and that that is the fundamental and paramount purpose that we have, it puts all others in perspective. The second week we talked about it, what it means to be an ambassador for Christ. What it means to be an ambassador for the kingdom. That we are called to be representatives of a kingdom that has come and conquered a land. Not that it has conquered a country per se, but it conquered Satan. It conquered his kingdom in this earth. And much like D-Day, um, where a war was won, but yet for quite a while afterwards, there were skirmishes that still had to be fought, even though the war was technically over. That's kind of where we find ourselves today. And so we are coming into, and we've been placed in a conquered land to educate people on the new kingdom, to begin to share with them what the kingdom of God is like, to represent the kingdom, not represent ourselves. We lay our own identity aside for the sake of the identity of the kingdom of which we are a part. And to communicate well the characteristics of that kingdom and the fundamental characteristic of the kingdom of God is loving one another and showing God's love to the world. And then last week we looked at kind of the flip side of the coin where ambassadors are kind of more diplomatic. Last week we looked at what it means to be a soldier of the cross. That as a soldier, there's many things, you know. It's understanding that when you become a Christian, you have enlisted in his army. But that we are, even though we're engaged in war, we are not engaged in war against men or against governments or against uh, anything of this world. But our war, as it tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers of the dark world. It's against Satan himself. And that we are to live a life that is not going to give up, that will stay true to the mission that God has given to us, and we will serve him unreservedly. That we will know our commander's voice and that we will seek to fulfill his mandate. Today, though, I want us to kind of move in a totally different direction. And we are going to be talking about another caricature of the believer, and we find this in First Peter, chapter two, verses four through ten, and it says there, "As you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious." And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. 
They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are called to be priests of the Most High God. And if we, as we look at this passage of Scripture, it would almost look as though there's more than one caricature here. That there seems to be more than one picture we're being painted because we hear on this one side about being a holy priesthood or a royal priesthood as it says later uh, down through that passage. But it also is talking about rocks and stones and cornerstones. And it can almost seem like they're two different pictures but they are really not. For if you actually read closely verse 5 it said you yourselves like living stones are being built up you are in the process of being built up as a spiritual house. Why? To be a holy priesthood. So it's all about being priests before God. And so what is that? Well, in Scripture, at first we know that every man was, in a sense, his own priest. He presented his own sacrifices to God. We see this with Cain and Abel way back in the book of Genesis. But afterwards, that office devolved on the head of the family, as was in the case of Noah in Genesis chapter 8, or Abraham in chapters 12 and 13, and then of his son Isaac in chapter 26, his son Jacob in chapter 31, and also of Job in Job chapter 1 verse 5. So it first started with ourselves, it then moved to the head of the family, but then we also see that it became an actual office that was held. The name of the first office was actually mentioned in Genesis chapter 14 verse 8 as it applied to Melchizedek. And under the Levitical arrangements, the offer of the priesthood was limited to the tribe of Levi. You'll remember that there's actually 12 tribes in Israel. So the, the, the office of priesthood was limited to only one of those tribes. That was the tribe of Levi, but actually to only one family of that tribe, and that was the family of Aaron. So that's kind of the history of it, but what does it mean for us today? What does it mean for us here in the 21st century to be priests? Well, the first thing I want to do is help us understand what it's not. It's not to say that we all need to go out and buy black shirts with white clerical collars. That is not what it's calling us to. We are not necessarily called to have to be priests of a church. And we are not called to discharge some of the functions, some of the key functions that we see in the Old Testament that were performed by priests, such as the fact that they were called to offer up sacrifices for the sins of men. We are not called to do that. Jesus has already done that. It tells us in Romans chapter 6 verses 9 and 10, we know that Christ being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Jesus came, he died, and he died to pay the penalty for sin one time for all sin. Past, present, and future. Uh, the blood of Jesus Christ is able to be applied to your life and to mine today. We do not need to bring sacrifices. And we do not need to receive sacrifices from other people to offer them up uh, for their sin. Because Jesus already paid for that sin. We also are not called to be the high priest. Because Jesus was and is that you see, the chief priest is what the high priest was. He is the priest of the priests. And for us, Jesus is our 
priest. He is our model. He is the one we follow. He is the one we take our orders from. He is the chief priest. The only one, by the way, to be able to offer up atonement for the sins of the nation was the high priest. And he did this once a year by entering into the Holy of Holies and putting sprinkling blood on what was called the mercy seat, which sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, it, we read this. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus offered the price of atonement for our sins. Another thing that we find is that to the high priest and to him alone pertained um, the ability to represent the congregation before the Lord as a mediator and to receive divine communication from God. And we are not called to have to do that. But now here's the great thing. That even though there's some of these things that we cannot do or are not meant to do as the high priest, there are some of these high priestly aspects that have been delegated back to us. There's some of these benefits that we receive. The two that we see in these two sections is this. First of all, as we just mentioned, that they were given the ability to receive divine communication straight from God. We now, because of the price that Jesus paid and the way that was paid for us to be able to enter into the Holy of Holies, because when Jesus died, the, the curtain that divided the holy place from the Holy of Holies, that separated this place where um, the priest could go, but from the one and only place that only the high priest could enter and only once a year, that was separated by a curtain, and that curtain was rent from top to bottom, as though God himself reached down and tore it. Painting a picture for us that we now have the ability to enter in, that we have the ability to hear from God. We have the ability to experience the presence of God, to be able to receive the glory of God. And along with that is that what we, which we read in Hebrews chapter 4, where it said, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. It's a great privilege we have to be able to enter into the throne room of God. This is something people in the Old Testament were not allowed to do. But God has made the way for it through his son Jesus and has delegated that back to us. Even though we are not high priests, he has given us that ability as his priests. The high priest also alone could wear the garments for glory and for beauty. He alone, as we said, was allowed to sprinkle the blood of the sinner offering on the mercy seat. He was to be ceremonially pure, ceremonially holy, and he was also to not have any physical defect. He was supposed to be physically perfect, and if he did have any defect or deformity, he was disqualified as a member of the priestly family from performing the duties of the office, it tells us in Leviticus chapter 21. It tells us he must not rend his clothes nor defile himself, even for his father or his mother. He was to truly be set apart for the Lord. One of the key things we do need to re realize is that as priests, even though we are not called to wear these clerical collars, even though we are not called to be the high priest, even though we are not called to offer up sacrifices for sin of men, we are still called to be priests. There's still a lot of other aspects of the priesthood that apply to us. And before we get into these nine characteristics, we need to remember that to be a priest was not something that you sought to attain. It wasn't a job application you could fill out. It was not something you could just go away to school to become and get a degree and, and now you've got a title after your name. The priesthood <coughs> excuse me, was a role that was commanded and commissioned by God to a group of people, specifically the um, sons of Aaron and Aaron. 
The role was commanded and commissioned by God. He is the one that set them up. He is the one that d decided which tribe the priestly order would come through. And the authenticity of that priesthood was determined by your birthright. If you were a son of Aaron, you were a priest. And let me tell you today that if you are a son of God, you are a priest. If you are a child of God, you are a priest of the priestly order. Priesthood is not a choice. It is a divine mandate and it is a family responsibility that we possess. We are all called to be priests of his presence. So what, were, what are these nine things that we are called to do? Well, as I said, the first thing that we see with a priest is that he was a mediator between man and God. Now, we are not called to mediate. We have one mediator, and that is Jesus Christ, who, who goes before the Father on our behalf, Scripture tells us. But as a mediator, what he, in essence, did, what the priest did, is he stood as a representative, or dare I say, an ambassador, as we talked about two weeks ago. He served as an ambassador of God to man and of man to God. He, set, he stood as an ambassador of God to men. He came as that representative, as we talked about two weeks ago, of the, of the spiritual kingdom of heaven in this world before men. But he was also called to be a representative of men to God. What do I mean by this? We need to understand that we are called to intercede. We are called to actually pray for, to stand in the gap for others. We are to stand in the gap for our family, for our friends, for our workmates, for our government, for our communities. We are called to be a representative of them before God. We see a picture of this when um, God took Abraham to show him Sodom and Gomorrah and, and let him know that he was going to have to destroy these, these towns, these cities. And what the reason that, Jesus, or that God gave was that he had looked for somebody who would stand in the gap. That would stand in the gap that, that would intercede to keep this from having to take place, but it says he was able to find no one. My question is this, the people that are in your life, do they have somebody interceding for them? Are you interceding for them? Are you standing in the gap for them? Are you praying for their salvation? Are you praying for blessing? Are you praying for God to have his perfect way in their lives? Or are you praying what I call bad prayers? Are you praying prayers that are more of condemnation, more of rebuke and judgment, because those are prayers we are not called to pray. We are not called to pray the prayers of God, go get them. We are called to pray prayers of God, reveal your glory to them. Would you show your love to them, Lord? Would, would you do whatever's necessary to draw them to you? Would you show me, Lord, how it is I can maybe be that um, reflection of you in their lives that they would want to come to you. See, that's a totally different sort of prayer. But we are called to stand in the gap for them. Are you standing in the gap for them? A priest was not only called to be an intercessor, he was also called to take care of the Lord's house. Now, in saying this, we are not saying that you know, God's saying that everybody needs to come and clean the church. So you know what? That wouldn't be a bad idea <laughs> if everybody shared that burden. Um, but what we're talking about here is pretty profound because a priest took care of the Lord's house, took care of the temple, took care of the tabernacle. But here's the thing. The New Testament shares with us through the mouth of Paul that we now are temples of the Holy Spirit and that his presence lives within us. He has taken up residence in our hearts, not in a building. 
And so when it says that the priests took care of the Lord's house, we as priests are called to take care of our house. And what do I mean by this? Well, when you look at the tab- temple and the tabernacle, especially as it related to the priests throughout the book of Leviticus, you will see that God gave them very explicit instructions on what to do and exactly how they were to do it. And those things were not to be deviated from. There were commandments as far as how they were to orchestrate the things within the temple. There was a way they were to live. There was a way they were to behave and respond. And can I say that God is making similar commands of us. That there are certain commands he expects us to follow. There are certain ways that he expects us to behave. Ways he expects us to respond. And not just the thou shalt nots, but also the thou shalts. And how well are we discharging those commands that he has given us so that the temple can be pure? See, the priest made sure the temple was properly reflecting the commandments and the directions of the Lord. And we need to make sure that our lives are reflecting the commandments and the directions of the Lord. To the point that those that look at us can see that happening. A priest was also called to raise up sheep and lambs for the daily sacrifice. They tended to these animals for the daily sacrifice. There's two things going on in that statement. The first thing we see is they raised up sheep and lambs. Well, what does that have to do with us? Well, very clearly, Jesus said that he is the good shepherd, meaning that we are the sheep of his pastures, it talks about in the book of Psalms. So a priest, as they raised up sheep and lambs, we also are called to raise up those in the body of Christ. We find in Leviticus 10 and chapter 33, as well as 2 Chronicles 15, 3 and Ezekiel chapter 44, that the role of the priest was to teach the children of Israel the statutes of the Lord. They were to raise them up in that, to, to help them understand not only the commandments, but all of the, the feasts and the festivals and all the things that God desired of them. The word we would use today is they discipled the people. And we are called, each and every one of us, not just the pastor of a church, not just the small group leaders, but every believer is called to help raise up those that are younger in the faith, that are less mature in the faith, to see them grow and develop in the people that God desires them to be, so that they can also be built up into this house of the Lord. It's all about helping them learn how to live their lives for Jesus Christ. But they weren't only called to raise up the sheep and lambs, they were called to raise them up. Why? for the daily sacrifice. You see, it wasn't just about helping people learn how to live their lives for Christ, it's also learning how to lay your life down for Christ. See, it's one thing to live according to his statutes, to live according to his plans and his purposes. It's another thing to be willing to lay your own life down, to be willing to lay down your own desires, your own hopes, your own dreams for the sake of God. Now, it's not to say that he won't take some of those hopes and dreams and restructure them so that they bring glory and honor unto him, but it might mean some of those things just have to die altogether for the sake of his glory and for the sake of his kingdom, for him to do something even greater and better through you. Are you willing to lay your life down for the Lord? A priest also welcomed any sinner who came to the Lord to ask for forgiveness. Anyone that entered into the gate of the tabernacle, into the outer courts there, or or even with the temple into the courts there as well, where the altar sacrifice was laid. Anybody that came in with with that sheep or that lamb, or, or if they were poor, the doves, To offer that sacrifice for their sins, the priest would welcome that. He would take it. He would offer it up without a word for the sake of the people because he loved them, because he wanted to see them walk in wholeness. How are we doing at welcoming sinners and welcoming people that are seeking God? 
I'm reminded of a passage in the book of John where he says, in, or in one of the letters of John, where it says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't wait for us to get our act straightened out. He didn't wait for us to begin to seek after him. He didn't even wait for us to get to that point where we were beginning to even contemplate that there might be something to this Jesus thing. It tells us that while we were yet sinners, while we were actually the enemies of God, while we were going a totally separate direction, wanting nothing to do with him, it was then that he came and he died for us. And why did he die for us? Because he loved us. For God so loved the world, right? that he gave his only son. Jesus laid his life down, it tells us also, willingly for the sake of our salvation. But he did it while we were sinners. And my question for you is this, how well are we welcoming the sinners? How well are we welcoming those that are, maybe look different than us, act different than us, that maybe are not where we are at spiritually, maybe they're just beginning Maybe they're just beginning to search. Are we willing to love them the way that Christ loved us unconditionally? Reminded of a story of a man back in the early 70s in the church that I was growing up in. And it was during the Jesus movement. And prior to the Jesus movement, you walked into any church and people all looked fairly similar to each other. Pretty much everybody, when they came to church, they dressed up in their suits, their ties, the women in their dresses maybe with their fancy hats. But they came wearing their best, properly groomed, and then the Jesus movement hit. And now all of a sudden you saw people coming in to church in their jeans and with their hair hanging down to their, to their shoulders. And of course these sorts of people were often also referred to as those that were for the whole um, you know, do what feels good, the free drugs, the free sex movement. And to our shame in those days, the church began to look at anybody that had long hair as being one of those people. And though it was never said to this man, to my knowledge in the church, the look said it all. But there was a man that came in, he had hair that was hanging down low, and there are people that ridiculed him for the length of his hair. How can you proclaim to know Christ and come in looking like that? How welcoming is that? And there's sometimes where, you know, our welcoming is that, um, or our lack of welcoming is that, obvious. There's other times I think though that we don't mean to be unwelcoming. We actually mean it, mean, mean to be godly. We, we, we try to do things the right way, but in our righteousness, if you will, we sometimes damage souls along the way and communicate something very unwelcoming without intending to do so. I saw a situation of, like this um, in another church, in a church my dad pastored in the uh, late 80s. And there was uh, this one specific Sunday and people were hanging up coats in the, uh, in the foyer area. And all of a sudden there were these two boys. They obviously did not come from a very well-to-do home. Their faces were filthy and their jeans were ripped. But you know what? They were walking by the church and they decided they wanted to come in. So they walk through the doors, and this one lady, great saint, great, a person who really loved the Lord, no doubt about it. But she looked at those children, and not meaning anything harsh, just looked at them in the eyes and said, you know, you can't come, into, you can't come before God looking like that. And those boys all of a sudden hung their heads in shame. And they walked out of the church that day, and for the next number of years, my dad pastored there, and he pastored there many years. Those children were never seen back at the doors of that church. Was that very welcoming? What, what are we communicating? Even amidst our desires to be righteous, are we communicating the heart of Christ? 
to those that are around and about us. A priest was also called to live together with other priests in community. In the time of David, the priests, you see, were divided into 24 um, courses or classes, it tells us in 1 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 7 through 18. The priests were actually not distributed over the country, but they lived together in certain cities which had been assigned to their use. And then from there they went up in turn to minister in the temple at Jerusalem. But these priests were called to come together to live in community. Now, I'm not saying we all need to go and join a monastery or that we all need to develop communes and huddle together in those. But we are called into a community to live in community. See, it's about how we show our love amidst the world in which we live. You see, Jesus said... Um, that you will know, they will know that you're my disciples by the love that you have for one another. It's not by how many programs you have or how many Bible studies you attend or how many verses you've memorized or even how much time you spend on your knees in prayer. What he said is they're going to know you're my disciples by the fact of how well you can love each other. And how can they see the love that we have for one another unless we are living in some sort of sense of community. We have got to be willing to build life on life with one another. And to not be part of a body of believers, to not be engaged in that level, is to actually deny a part of our priestly role and not fulfilling all of what it is God has destined for us. He wants us to come together. He wants us to be involved. And, and I know that right now amidst COVID-19, we can't always come together physically, but we can still be in community with each other. We can still have that kind of love that, that is exemplified as we reach out to each other, whether it be through the internet, whether it be by phone, whether it be by letters, whether it be driving by somebody's ho home and simply honking the horn, or you know, yelling from a distance, whatever the case is but being willing to live in community with each other, letting the world see the love of Christ through us. We see that in Acts 2, 42 through 47, where they gathered together, where, where they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, to, to prayer, and uh, to the reading of the word. It says that many signs and wonders were done, but then it goes on for a number of verses to talk about how they loved one another, how they... Um, sold their possessions and they gave to each other as they had need and how they gathered in one another's homes uh, and had fellowship with each other and they de grew in favor with God and with man and tells us that God added daily to their number those that were being saved. They lived together in community, in a community. A priest was also called to watch over the fires on the altar of the burnt offering, and to keep it always burning. It tells us this in Leviticus 6, 12, 2 Chronicles chapter 13, 11 as well. They were called to watch over this fire of the altar of burnt offering day and night. Whether sacrifices were being offered on it or not, that fire was to be kept ablaze. Now, it's not that they had to camp out at the altar that they had to stay there and, and gaze on it the, the whole entire time. But they did make sure that that fire didn't go out. That they understood, they f constantly found themselves having to come back to this place where sacrifices were offered for sin. It, it's keeping before themselves this, this picture of what it really means to be an individual and that we are all Sinners, no matter if we're priests or not, we have all had to offer sacrifices on that altar, is what they were saying and seeing. You see, we are children of God. We are the saints of the Most High God. He has made us that when we have named his name. But we must also never forget that we are also simply sinners saved by grace. We are both. It's, it's 
going to be detrimental to us to simply focus on the fact that we are saints and begin to forget that we are sinners because what happens then is we can begin to see ourselves as holier than thou and begin to actually get an us and them mentality and begin to think somehow we are better than we are. But we need to remain in this place where we are able to approach this altar on a regular basis to realize that, you know what, I am a sinner. Because when I realize that I am a sinner that's simply saved by grace, that gives me the ability and the desire and the drive to want to come alongside others that don't know Christ, that are also sinners, to say, you know what, I've got the antidote for what it is you're going through. You're suffering from a virus worse than COVID-19. It's one that'll steal your soul. But you know what? I know the vaccine. And that vaccine is the blood of Jesus Christ. It has helped me, and I know it will help you as well. That is a call that we have to watch over this fire. Do not stray far from the cross. Always remember that cross was for you. But a priest was also called to keep the lamps stand in the holy place filled with oil. Many scholars believe that God's command for the floral design of this menorah that sat in the holy place was designed that way to remind the Israelites of the tree of life from the Garden of Eden that we read about in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. And this is certainly an appropriate conclusion as true life we know is only found in the presence of God. Psalm 16 verse 11 tells us, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there's fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In your presence there's fullness of joy. And this presence was made manifest, it tells us, in the tabernacle. In Exodus chapter 40 verses 34 to 35 says the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. You see, there was to be a constant awareness of his presence and the light was to be allowed to drive away any darkness that was in the room. See, when, when we keep that lampstand filled with oil and we light those candles because they had to or light that lampstand you had to light it because there's no windows in the ta- tabernacle if you're going to have any light it was only going to come from that candle but when you lit it it drove all the darkness away it exposed everything in the room and it's allowing God to expose things in our own lives as priests we've got to be willing to let him do that but it's not only that it's also allowing him to illuminate what he desires, or those things of him. Because when that lampstand was lit, it also illuminated things such as the altar of incense that represented worship that goes up for God. It also illuminated that curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, separated where the priest was from that place where they could only enter once a year, that place where the Shekinah glory of God, where the actual presence of God resided. When we let and take care of the lampstand, we're allowing God to illuminate the bad in us, but also to illuminate everything that is of him. A priest was also called to proclaim loudly and boldly the unity and advancement of the Lord's people. During the journeys in the wilderness, as the people started on each day's march, they were to blow an alarm with long silver trumpets. We read about this in Numbers chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. It says this, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets of hammered work. You shall make them, and you shall use them for the summoning of the congregation and for breaking camp. When both are blown, all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. But if they blow only one, then the chiefs, the heads of the tribes of Israel, shall gather themselves to you. When you blow an alarm, the camps that are on the east side shall set out. And when you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that are on the south side shall set out. An alarm is to be blown whenever they are to set out. But when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow a long blast but you shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron the priests shall blow the trumpets. The trumpets shall be to you for a perpetual statue throughout your generations. Two things we see in this, in this blowing of the trumpets, of being bold, 
It was the first call to assemble the church before the presence of God. It was called an assembly, and the assembly was to gather at the tent of meeting, at that place where the presence of God resided. And what it was doing is it was summoning a call to unity. So it was calling them together to be unified in heart and mind to one God. But it's also understanding that it was calling them from the things that were occupying them. It was the, the, they're involved in day-to-day -day activities, but when those trumpets blew, they knew it's time to gather before the Lord. And you know, there's a lot of times that brothers and sisters in Christ will find themselves getting almost so preoccupied with the things of the world and the things of the day-to-day -day living that sometimes we lose sight of the tent of meeting. We lose sight of the presence of God. And you know, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as other priests, it is our job to blow the trumpet, to be able to call them, woo them back over to the tent of meeting, woo them back to the presence of God, to have them draw close to him, but just as much as these trumpets were used to draw people together, it was also used to send them out. Because it was understood that there would come a time when God would have them move on. And as the presence of God moved, so they were to move. And we need to be aware that there's times when God is moving and doing a new thing. We are seeing that definitely today. We are seeing great things happen amidst this terrible pandemic. But we are seeing some great things with churches all over the, this country, across denominational lines, where on average it seems to be four times um, of the people that are attending these services that are online versus those that have ever darkened the doorsteps of the church. We are reaching more for the sake of Christ because we are willing to move on um, and take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of us. And so, as God moves, we have to be willing to move so that we can fully engage in what he is doing. But all of this, all these things that are taking place come down to this. And it comes down to the fact that the priest had free access into the presence of God to offer up sacrifices of praise, thanksgiving, and sacrifices of grateful service, grateful worship from one day to the next. The priest's role was all about God. It was all about being in his presence. It was all about seeing his glory come. And that has got to be one of our main goals, is that everything that we are about is about seeing God's presence made real in our lives and the lives of those that are around and about us. To see his glory fall. To see his presence overtake to the point that we are transformed beyond measure. Are you willing to be used of God like that? I hope you are. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you have called us to such a high honor to be priests in your kingdom, to be priests of your presence. You've entrusted your presence to us, not just for ourselves, but to take it to the world. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us from this day forward to learn how to do that better. To know how to discharge the duties of our office in a very um, efficient way, in a way that, Lord, is excellent and praiseworthy for you. And God, we give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>